Things Fall Apart, Chapter 9. For the first time in three nights, Akonko slept. He woke up once in the middle of the night, and his mind went back to the past three days without making him feel uneasy. He began to wonder why he had felt uneasy at all. It was like a man wondering in broad daylight why a dream had appeared so terrible to him at night. He stretched himself and scratched his thigh where a mosquito had bitten him as he slept. Another one was wailing near his right ear. He slapped the ear and hoped he had killed it. Why do they always go for one's ears? While he was a child, his mother had told him a story about it, but it was as silly as all women's stories. Mosquito, she had said, had asked ear to marry him, whereupon ear fell on the floor in uncontrollable laughter. How much longer do you think you will live? She asked. You are already a skeleton. Mosquito went away humiliated, and any time he passed her way, he told ear that he was still alive. Aconqua turned on his sign and went back to sleep. He was roused in the morning by someone banging on his door. Who is that, he growled, and he knew it must be Aqueefy. Of his three wives, Aqueefy was the only one who would have the audacity to bang on his door. Azima's dying, came her voice, and all the tragedy and sorrow of her life were packed in those words. Akonko sprang from the bed, pushed back the bolt on his door, and ran into Aqueefy's hut. Azima lay shivering on a mat beside a huge fire that her mother had kept burning all night. It is Eba, said Akonko, as he took his machete and went into the bush to collect leaves and grasses and barks of trees that went into making the medicine for Eba. Aquifi knelt beside the sick child, occasionally filling it with her palm, the wet burning forehead. Azima was the only child in the center of her mother's world. Very often it was Azima who decided what food her mother should prepare. Aquifi even gave her such delicacies as eggs, which children were rarely allowed to eat because such food tempted them to steal. One day, as Azima was eating an egg, Akonkwa had come in unexpectedly from his hut. He was greatly shocked and swore to beat Aquifi if she dared to give the child eggs again, but it was impossible to refuse Azima anything. After her father's rebuke, they developed an even keener appetite for eggs, and she enjoyed, above all, the secrecy in which she now ate them. Her mother always took them into her bedroom and shut the door. Azima did not call her mother Ni nee, like all children. She called her by the name Aquifi, as her father and other grown-up people did. The relationship between them was not only that of mother and child, there was something in it like the companionship of equals, which was strengthened by such little conspiracies as eating eggs in the bedroom. Aquifi had suffered a good deal in her life. She had borne ten children, and nine of them had died in infancy, usually before the age of three. As she buried one child after another, her sorrow gave way to despair, and then to grim resignation. The birth of her children, which should be a woman's crowning glory, became for Aquifi more physical, mere physical ag agony devoid of promise. The naming ceremony after seven market weeks became an empty ritual. Her deepening despair found expression in the name she gave her children. One of them was a pathetic cry, Onwombiko, death I implore you, but death took no notice. Onwombiko died in his 15th month. The next child was a girl, a Zomina, May it not happen again. She died in her 11 month and two others after her. Aquifi then became defiant and called her next child Onwoma. Death may please itself. And he did. After the death of Aquifi's second child, Akonko had gone to a medicine man. He was also a diviner for, of the Afa Oracle to inquire what was amiss. His man told him that his child was an Obanji, one of those wicked children who, when they died, entered their mother's wombs to be born again. When your wife becomes pregnant again, he said, let her not sleep in her hut. Let her go away and stay with her people, and that way she will elude her wicked tormentor and break its evil cycle of birth and death. Aquifi did as she was asked. As soon as she became pregnant, she went to live with her old mother in another village. It was there that her third child was born and circumcised on the eighth day. She did not return to Akonko's compound until three days before the naming ceremony. The child was called Onwombiko. Onwombiko was not given a proper burial when he died. Akonkwo had called in another medicine man who was famous in the clan for his great knowledge about Obanshi children. His name was Okagbu Oyanwa. Okagbu was a very striking figure, tall with a full beard and a bald head. He was light in complexion and his eyes were fire, red and fiery. He always gnashed his teeth as he listened to those who came to consult him. He asked Akonkwo a few questions about the dead child. All of the neighbors and relations who had come to mourn gathered round them. On what market day was it born, he asked. Oi, replied Akonkwo, and it died this morning? Akonkwo said yes, and only then realized for the first time that the child had died on the same market day as it had been born. The neighbors and relations also saw that coincidence and said among themselves that it was very significant. Where do you sleep? with your wife in your obi or in her own hut asked the medicine man 
in her hut in future call her into your obi the medicine man then ordered that there should be no mourning for the dead child he brought out a sharp razor from his goatskin bag slung over from his left shoulder and began to mutilate the child then he took it away to bury in the evil forest holding it by the ankle and dragging it on the ground behind him. After such treatment, it should think twice before coming again, unless it was one of the stubborn ones who returned, carrying the stamp of their mutilation, a missing finger or perhaps a dark line where the medicine man's razor had cut them. By the time a Wambiko died, Aquifi had become a very bitter woman. Her husband's first wife had already had three sons, all strong and healthy. When she had borne her third son in succession, Akonko had slaughtered a goat for her, as was the custom. Aquifi had nothing but good wishes for her, but she had grown so bitter about her own she that she could not rejoice with others over their good fortune. And so on the day that Noe's mother celebrated the birth of her three sons with feasting and music, Aquithi was the only person in the happy company who went about with a cloud on her brow. Her husband's wife took this for malevolence, as husband's wives were wont to. How could she know that Aquithi's bitterness did not flow outwards to others, but inwards to her own soul? And she did not blame others for their good fortune, but her own evil she who denied her any. At last, Azima was born, and although ailing, she seemed determined to live. At first, Aquifi accepted her, as she had accepted others, with listless resignation. But when she lived on to her fourth, fifth, and sixth years, love returned once more to her mother, and with love, anxiety. She determined to nurse her child to health, and she put all of her being into it. She was rewarded by occasional spells of health, during which Azima bubbled with energy like fresh palm wine. At such times, she seemed beyond danger. But all of a sudden, she would go down again. Everyone knew... Everybody knew she was an Obanji. These sudden bouts of sickness and health were typical of her kind, and she had lived so long that perhaps she had decided to stay. Some of them did become tired of their evil rounds of birth and death, or took pity on their mothers and stayed. Akwiki believed deep inside her that Azima had come to stay. She believed it because it was that faith alone that gave her life any kind of meaning, and this faith had been strengthened when a year or so ago the medicine man had dug up Azima's iwi ua. Everybody knew then that she would live because her bond with the world of Obanji had been broken. Aquifi was reassured, but such was her anxiety for her daughter that she could not rid herself completely of her fear. And although she believed that Iwi Ua, had, which had been dug up, was genuine, she could not ignore the fact that some really evil children sometimes misled people into digging up a specious one. But Azima's Iwi Ua had looked real enough. It was a smooth pebble wrapped in a dirty rag. The man who dug it up was the same Obanji Okajbu, who was famous in all the clan for his knowledge on these matters. Azima had not wanted to cooperate with him at first, but that was only to be expected. No Abanji would yield their secrets easily, and most of them never did because they died too young before they could ask, be asked questions. Where did you bury your iwi ua? Okajbu asked Azima. She was nine then and had just recovered from serious illness. What is iwi ua? she asked in return. You know what it is. You buried it in the ground somewhere so that you can die and return again to torment your mother. Azima looked at her mother, whose eyes, sad and pleading, were fixed on her. Answer the question at once, roared Okonkwa, who stood behind her. All the family were there, and some of the neighbors, too. Leave her to me, the medicine man told Okonkwa in a cool, confident voice. He returned again to Azima. Where did you bury your iwi ua? Where they bury children, she replied, and the quiet spectators murmured to themselves. Come along, then, and show me the spot, said the medicine man. The crowd set out with Azima leading the way, and Okajibu following closely behind her. Akankwo came next, and Akwifi followed him. When she came to the main road, Azima turned left as if she was going to the stream. Stream. But you said it was where they buried children, asked the medicine man. No, said Azima, whose feeling of importance was manifested in her sprightly walk. She sometimes broke into a run and stopped again suddenly. The crowd followed her silently. Women and children returning from the stream with pots of water on their head wondered what was happening, until they saw Akajbu and guessed it must have been something to do with Obanji. And they all knew Akwifi and her daughter very well. When she got into the big Odula, when she got to the big Odala tree, Azima turned left into the bush and the crowd followed her. Because of her side, she made her way through the trees and creepers more quickly than her followers. The bush was alive and the thread of feet and dry leaves and sticks and the moving aside of tree branches. Azima went deeper and deeper and the crowd went back to, with her. And then suddenly she turned around and began to walk back to the road. Everybody stood to let her pass and then filed after her. If you bring us all this way for nothing, I shall beat sense into you, Okonkwo threatened. I have told you to let her alone. I know how to deal with them, said Okajbu. Azima led the way back to the road, looked left and right, and turned right. And so they returned home again. Where did you bury your iwi ua? asked Okajbu, and Azima finally stopped outside her father's obi. Okajbu's voice was unchanged. It was quiet and confident. 
It is near that orange tree, as Inma said. And why did you not say so, you wicked daughter of Akaloji, Jolie? Akonkwa swore furiously. And why did you not say so, you wicked daughter of Akalo Jolie? Akonkwa swore furiously. The medicine man ignored him. Come and show me the exact spot, he said quietly to Azima. It is here, she said when they got to the tree. Point at the spot with your finger, said Akashbu. It is here, said Azima, touching the ground with her finger. Akonkwa stood by, rumbling like thunder in the rainy season. Bring me a hoe, said Akashbu. When Akwifi brought the hoe, he had already put aside his goatskin bag and his big cloth and was in his underwear, a long and thin strip of cloth round one as round his waist like a belt, and then passed between the legs to be fastened to the belt behind. He immediately set to work digging a pit where Azima had indicated. The neighbors sat around watching the pit becoming deeper and deeper. The dark topsoil soon gave way to the bright red earth which with, with which women scrubbed the floors and walls of the huts. Akashbu worked tirelessly and in silence, his back shining with perspiration. Akashbu stood by the pit. He asked Akashbu to come up to rest while he took his hand. But Akashbu said he was not tired yet. Akwifi went into her hut to cook yams. Her husband had brought out more yams than usual because the medicine man had to be fed. Azima went with her and helped in preparing the vegetables. There is too much green vegetable, she said. Don't you see the pot is full of yams? Akwifi asked. And you know how the leaves come, become smaller after cooking. Yes, said Azima. That is why the snake lizard killed his mother. Very true, said Akwifi. He had given his mother seven baskets of vegetables to cook, and in the end there were only three, and so he killed her, said Azima. That is not the end of the story. Oh ho, said Azima, I remember now. He brought another seven baskets and cooked them himself, and there were again only three, so he killed himself too. Outside the obi, Akashbu and Akonkwa were digging the pit to find where Azima had buried her iwiua. Neighbors sat around watching. The pit was now so deep that they no longer saw the digger. They only saw red earth he threw up mounting higher and higher. Akonkwa saw Noi stood near the end of the pit because he wanted to take in all that happened. Akashbu had again taken over the digging from Akonkwo. He worked as usual in silence. The neighbors and Akonkwo's wives were now talking. The children had lost interest and were playing. Suddenly, Akashbu sprang to the surface with an agility of a leopard. It is very near now, he said. I have felt it. There was an immediate excitement, and those who were sitting jumped to their feet. Call your wife and child, he said to Akonkwo. But Akwifi and Azima had heard the noise and run out to see what it was. Akashbu went back into the pit, which was now surrounded by spectators. After a few more hoefuls of earth, he struck the iwi ua. He raised it carefully with the hoe and threw it to the surface. Some women ran away in fear that it was thrown when it was thrown, but they soon returned and everyone gazing at the rag from a reasonable distance. Akashbu emerged without saying a word or even looking at the spectators. He went to his goatskin bag, took out two leaves, and began to chew him. When he had swallowed them, he took up the rag with his left hand and began to untie it. And then the smooth, shiny pebble fell out. He picked it up. Is this yours? He asked Azima. Yes, she replied. All of the women shouted with joy because Akwifi's troubles were ended at last. All this had happened more than a year ago, and Azima had not been ill since. And then suddenly she had begun to shiver in the night. Akwifi brought her to the fireplace, spread her mat on the floor, and built a fire. But she had gotten worse and worse. As she knelt by her, feeling with her palm, the wet burning forehead, she prayed a thousand times. Although her husband's wives were saying that it was nothing more than Eba, she did not hear them. Akankwa returned from his bush, carrying on his left shoulder a large bundle of grasses and leaves, roots and barks of medicinal trees and her shrubs. He went into Aquifi's hut, put down his load, and sat again. Give me a pot, he said, and leave the child alone. Aquifi went to bring the pot, and Akankwa selected the best from his bundle, in their due proportions, and cut them up. He put them in the pot, and Aquifi poured in some water. Is that enough? She asked when she had poured in about half of the water in the bowl. A little more. I said a little. Are you deaf? Akankwa roared at her. She sat the pot on the fire, and Akankwa took up his machete to return to his obi. You must watch the pot carefully, he said as he went, and don't allow it to boil over. If it does, its power will be gone. He went away to his hut, and Aquifi began to tend the medicine pot, almost as if it was itself a sick child. Her eyes went constantly from Azima to the boiling pot and back to Azima. Akankwa returned when he felt the medicine had cooked long enough. He looked it over and said it was done. Bring me a low stool for Azima, he said in a thick mat. He took down the pot from the fire and placed it in front of the stool, and then he roused Azima and placed her on the stool astride the streaming pot. The thick mat was thrown over both. Azima struggled to escape from choking and overpowering steam, but she was held down. He started, she started to cry. When the mat was at least removed, she was drenched in perspiration. Perspiration. Aquifi mopped her with a piece of cloth, and she lay down on a dry mat and was soon asleep.